short-term cooling. There's also, as you have suggested, people who are thinking it's in the jet it's themselves to de deliver toxic materials. I'm trying to get to researched, empirically verifiable sources. So yeah, I recommend the Carnicum Institute to anybody who please, wants to please investigate. Please come up and give me anything afterwards because I've been, obviously, I, I should say obviously, maybe it's obvious to you, it might be obvious to everybody. When I ask Environment Canada for information they have, when I look to government sources for any information that verifies this, they say it's just not happening. I'm prepared to be sufficiently skeptical to keep looking to find out when, it, when and where it's happening. And I know that it's widely held as a concern in this community. So I don't dismiss it. I just don't have enough information to say on a verifiable, there's certainly nothing in the peer-reviewed literature. And I well, don't... Well, it explains the peculiar yeah. tra trails we see behind jet craft that we didn't see 15 years ago. And I know a lot of people agree with you, and I'm just, I'm being as fair as I can about it. I'm not with you yet, but I am looking for the information, wanna, and I hope that doesn't let down too many people in the room. But that's, I have to have science. I get vilified for standing for science when there really is science, so I've got to be very careful not to step out into an issue where I can't find the information that backs me up. But there's a lot of opinion that backs it up, and there's a lot of, there are a lot of photographs that are peculiar. I agree with you. But I don't have the science to say out loud, yes, I think this is happening. I do think there's reasons to investigate what's going on, because a lot of people believe something is occurring, as you've described. Now, I'm trying to be on the aisle there. Yeah, thanks. Um, first off, I want to say thank you so much uh, for coming to speak with us here in this room and for patiently answering our questions one after the other. Um, so I have a question, but it's just a really short lead up to it. Um, now, I wouldn't doubt that most people in this room, if not most of Victorians, feel pretty worn out with the issue of the Northern Gateway Pipeline. Um, and I figured, or maybe you would have anticipated that it would be brought up uh, tonight. But, um, yeah, so you were also mentioning like public hearings around pipelines and how um, it's more now that those who are directly affected, um, who may be uh, close to the pipeline, projected pipeline route, and I do believe that they call them public hearings for reasons, for reason, not public listenings. Um, <laughs> but um, I was, I'm, I'm kind of um, going to make a reference to the Dogwood Initiative and um, their campaign for the, the Citizens Initiative, um, which is, uh, for those who might not know, um, basically coordinating all of BC to sign a petition um, against the Northern Gateway Pipeline. Um, so it's going to each riding and trying to gather at least 10% of the registered voters to sign the petition. Um, and then that's going to be aggregated from what I understand and then introduced to the private members bill in Parliament. Now I'm just wondering what you think like for its um, likeliness of being passed. I know that Kristen Clark would probably be, um, if she wants to get voted in again, seriously have to consider this. But, um, yeah. Okay, so first of all, thank you for being here. You're one of the younger participants who isn't, you know, in elementary school. So I'm glad to have <laughs> the voices of youth here in the room. I, you know, the the fact that the joint review panel conditionally approved this, you've got to look at the National Energy Board report if you haven't looked at it. It is thin. It is appalling. They they actually ignored the fundamental things. There's a great blog on it for anyone who wants a quick read. Chris Turner who just recently wrote the book on Harper's War on Science, wrote a blog where he said, when you're reading this report, you can almost feel the document shrug in your hands. <laughs> well, there are all these things happening, yeah, but hey, we need it. So it's a very thin document. Now, there's uh, other initiatives by NGOs. Uh, two groups have recently filed a court challenge saying that the National Energy Board failed in terms of its responsibility under legislation by writing such a thin document. So that's one approach. We know that First Nations will be going to court to say, look, we have a, you have a fiduciary responsibility under the Constitution of this country uh, as a federal government and as Enbridge to have had meaningful and real consultations with us. There's this little bit of a time that we have now before the federal government decides how to handle the recommendations from the National Energy Board. Now is the time to be raising hell about this. Don't wait 
for a plebiscite. Don't wait for the demonstration. I have so many people who are wonderful and earnest and say, I'm ready to get arrested to stop that pipeline. Don't wait for your big heroic moment. Do the boring stuff now, because now is when it's in front of cabinet to review the National Energy Board recommendations, which have conditions. So please, if you're concerned about this issue, I know it's boring stuff. Write a lot of letters to the editor of the Eastern Canadian papers where they don't get it, why we don't want this pipeline and tankers and bitumen and dillowood on our coastline. As for the Dogwood Initiative idea, I haven't been asked about this publicly before, and Dogwood Initiative didn't ask my advice before they launched it, but I think it's kind of high risk. If it's a plebiscite, it's like the HST plebiscite, where it was amazing that enough British Columbians signed to force a plebiscite and a vote. But you know we, you have to have in every single writing. So the majority of British Columbians, I have no doubt, oppose uh, pipelines, two-way pipelines, Dillowit, toxic Dillowit going Kitimat to Alberta and then bringing back bitumen mixed with Dillowit from Alberta to Kitimat and then putting the mixture on, on super tankers through some of the most hazardous bodies of water anywhere on the planet through the Hecate Strait. I have no doubt that the majority of British Columbians oppose that concept. But can we get enough organization on the ground so that 10% of every single provincial riding in BC signs a petition and forces a plebiscite? That's what worries me. So it's a high risk strategy. If it takes off, and if Bill Vanderfam gets behind it, uh, <laughs> I, mean, I, I have to say that was an astonishing HST response. But we did see from the provincial election results that parts of BC, likely the coast, are more upset about the idea of tankers on our coastline. So the geography of it, I'm giving you a very candid answer. I think the Dogwood Initiative, I think Dogwood is a brilliant organization. I think they do great work. So I'm, if you can sign a petition and participate, great. But don't wait for plebiscites. Do everything you can now. If we're called to show up for a day of action against Enbridge, show up. By the way, Enbridge drives me nuts because they sponsor everything. I just had to send a note to my staff that once again, I'm declining the lovely invitation to go to the Governor General's Awards for the Performing Arts. I used to like to go, it's a good evening, and you get to see famous Canadians get awards, but for the last few years, it's sponsored by Enbridge. So I just can't go. I'm just waiting for the day when I turn on CPAC, it says the Parliament of Canada brought to you by Enbridge. So when you go, please do stuff in the short term now, before Harper rules on this, and keep up the pressure on Christy Clark. You're right about that. If she wants to get reelected, she will know. British Columbians don't want this. The majority don't want this. So we have to keep the pressure up provincially as we also pressure the cabinet of the federal cabinet. You know, Harper said he wouldn't push it up down British Columbia's throats if we don't want it. Uh, so we have to push back. Uh, now I went one, two, and then yes, you are next. Um, we have a national central bank here, our Bank of Canada. And uh, since it was nationalized in 1938 until 1974 when Trudeau decided to stop using it, we funded lots of infrastructure and, uh, and our government, our federal deficit. Um, so my question is, if Jim Flaherty is so keen on ending our deficit, why doesn't he use our Bank of Canada? And then number two, for our uh, beloved sewage treatment plan, why don't we fund that for the Bank of Canada as well so we don't have to pay any extra taxes? <coughs> And the, did the question carry? No. Okay, the question was on monetary policy. We do have a Bank of Canada Act. The Bank of Canada exists uh, to provide interest-free loans to the government of Canada as required for projects in the national interest. Why do we not use those? Why do we borrow from private banks? Why do we have interest payments on loans to the government of Canada? Uh, and the policy that, that my party has is that we should review the, the Bank of Canada Act and use for future loans, we should be looking at the Bank of Canada and monetary policy as a solution to reducing debt and deficit. We don't favor just canceling all of our debts because there's also, of course, the impact would be very um, disruptive to the Canadian economy if Canada just decided to ignore its relationships with the commercial banks. So it's kind of a, it's, it's a I would characterize our current position as a party as, as more middle of the road than you know, monetary policy is the solution for everything. I think we need to look at the Bank of Canada Act and ask why we're not doing anything with borrowing
from an interest-free vehicle which is legal and exists and is there for us to use. So it, it would be, I would like to see it used for future borrowings as opposed to eradicating past debt, if, that's, if that makes sense as an answer. Now, just checking, we've got the room for 10 more minutes. How about we do, oh, I, yes, you were, I forgot you're way back there. I said I'd go to you next. After you, let me just do a quick look around and see if there's, yes, I said you, that we, one, two, and one more. Who's the last? Okay, there we go. Okay, so you, sir, in the very back. Yes, this is regarding the Charter of Rights and Freedoms in Canada and the Mental Health Act in British Columbia. Any senior or anybody opposing the pipeline uh, may come to the fact that they may be arrested by police under the Mental Health Act. In British Columbia, it is not law that police can provide verbal, or they don't provide for written reports. They can get away with providing a verbal report to the hospital. In the hospitals in British Columbia, they're of the belief that they do not have to provide a charter call to a lawyer to that person. This is wrong in Canada. Every person in Canada has a right to contact a lawyer when they're detained or arrested under mental health law or not. So people opposing the pipeline, if they're arrested by police, they get an immediate call to a lawyer to defend their rights. But if somebody is opposing the pipeline or anything else and under the mental health law, they have no right to a lawyer. A police officer could give a verbal report to ER and a person has no hope in defending themselves. So what can your office do to ensure that British Columbia follows the law of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms in Canada other provinces have been legislated in the Mental Health Act that the person must be provided with a call to lawyer. Police must provide uh, uh, in writing why they detain that person. Right. That's a very interesting point. Uh, it's not, I'm not deducting it, it's not federal, so I can't, it's, it's well, the, the, what, the best, the charter's federal, but provincial law is outside of what I can do, but I think it would be very useful to actually have a challenge at the provincial level in the courts on a charter basis of, of, these, of a mental health law that deprives people of their basic charter rights uh, because they can be apprehended without the acts. And I've seen some recent cases in the press that suggest that more people are noticing this. Uh, so I, I, I probably will talk to some provincial colleagues about it because if you raise a very good point, whether it could be applied for the Enbridge case or not, people should have access to pursue their rights. One area Related to that that I've been very concerned about is I've been made aware of quite a few cases of seniors who go who move into long-term care facility and then they decide they want to leave it and go back and live with their family and they're deprived of their right to do that or deprived of their right to choose what medication they have. So we need to protect civil liberties regardless of whether you're in care or custody uh, and preserve the individual's right whether they're a senior or, or perceived to have a mental health issue. I saw a recent case in the press where someone was assumed by colleagues and friends to potentially be so depressed that they were a suicide risk, and they were at that point deprived of basic ability to defend their rights, defend themselves, and get a hold of a lawyer. So we do need to review that, but it's provincial, that part is provincial law. Now, moving quickly, you are next. not on the path for lowering its emissions, uh, that it's promised for uh, 2015. Yeah. And uh, I'm just wondering how the rest of the world feels about this. And also, if the other countries that are getting closer to meeting their emissions are below, like, below that, what if they decide to sanction like trade relations with Canada? And wouldn't Parker maybe start to take notice of that? So did everyone hear the questions related to Canada's greenhouse gas emissions? We are not on track to meet the target. This is a target that Stephen Harper adopted, which is the second time he weakened our targets is our current target. So first he weakened them by repudiating Kyoto. Then he said our target was 20% below 2006 levels by 2020. He weakened that by making it 17% below 2005 levels by 2020. We are nowhere near on track to hit that because we haven't put in place action Interestingly enough, I'm quite convinced, I won't tell you how I'm convinced because it's too large a group of people and there's media in the room, but I have good information that they have the regulations ready for regulating in the oil sands under Peter Kent, but they were stymied and above the Minister of, so in the PMO they were stymied to bring. Now PMO and the Minister of Environment, Leona Lukak, are saying they won't have any regulations on the oil and gas sector for years. 
So there's no chance of us getting anywhere near that target to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So the second part of our question was, how are we seen in the world? Uh, could this result in trade sanctions against Canada? Yes, it absolutely could. The European Union has been talking about it for some time, that while they have carbon constrained economies, they're working hard to hit. By the way, the European Union has, is on track to completely soar past 20% below 1990 levels by 2020. They're talking about trying to go to 30% below 1990 levels. Now, the difference between 1990 levels and 2005 levels, so picking different base years has been one way that Harper has undermined global treaty making, but, but our emissions right now, if we get to 17% below 2005 levels by 2020, to put it on a par with the rest of the world, we'll be 3% above 1990 levels. Now, 1990 is the base year most countries use, and as I said, Europe is going to, European Union is going to be 20% below 1990 levels by 2020. I know it's a lot of statistics. So the rest of the world is looking at us and saying, yeah, why should we constrain our carbon emissions when a country like Canada is not, and they don't have, we don't have a carbon price or a carbon tax, and we still subsidize fossil fuels. So there have been people just in, in Europe, European countries discussing, in European Parliament, discussing trade sanctions against Canada. <coughs> How are we seen in the world? Well, when I was in Warsaw, as a Canadian parliamentarian, wearing the badge of the government of Afghanistan, <laughs> and I was so depressed about it, and I was talking to, of all things, a Saudi Arabian delegate. Now, they're not good at these negotiations. <laughs> but one of the Saudi Arabian delegates said to me, you know, I was in the Office for Compliance for the Kyoto Protocol when Canada withdrew. And I can tell you, we tried to talk Canada out of it. We tried to talk them out of it. And I get very teary at these kinds of things. And I thought, I'm so sorry, I'm so embarrassed. Said, okay, so here's the bizarre for me, was a Saudi Arabian diplomat patting me on the shoulder and saying, don't worry, we know this really isn't Canada. We've seen what Canada has done for years. This isn't normal. We know that. And then uh, Ban Ki-moon's reaction to seeing that I was a representative of the government of Afghanistan. <laughs> I explained to him, I'm an environmental refugee. <laughs> I had to go somewhere else. Anyway, um, it, it, is, it is appalling how much global prestige and reputation we lose by being a laggard on climate change. And we are right now. Uh, so appallingly uh, uncommitted to the kinds of actions that even Stephen Harper committed us to, which are weaker than anything previous governments had accepted. And so last question. Yeah, the one quick one and one a little more involved. Just would you please put democratizing the Constitution on your website? Get a book list going on your website. Okay, I'm reading material. That should go on with the second one is the Department of Fisheries and Oceans giving uh, streams, Saturn Street, it's, it's going to be for the National Energy Board to decide now what happens with uh, fish yep. issues. Could you explain that? Okay, so two, the first quick one was, can I put democratizing the Constitution and on the website and a book list of things that people might want to read? Good idea. Good, great idea. Now, the last householder I sent out was about democracy, and that it, although you got it in your mailboxes as a paper copy, it's also available online. But we can start adding books. I'll tell you right now, one I highly recommend in relation to questions I got earlier about minority parliaments is a book by Peter Russell, Professor Emeritus at University of Toronto, called Two Cheers for Minority Government. It's a very helpful short read. Gives you a really good perspective on Canadian parliamentary history. The, ne the second question is, what the heck is going on that the National Energy Board is in charge of deciding when fish are in trouble if there's a pipeline problem? This also goes back to C-38. The Fisheries Act was gutted, they removed habitat protections, but they also put in there that whenever a pipeline is being built, the National Energy Board, and not the Species at Risk Act, and not the Navigable Waters Protection Act, has primacy. And then under the Fisheries Act, it said that the regulation of fisheries can be delegated to other agencies by agreement. So that's how the National Energy Board 
is now going to be the only agency that looks at fish habitat. DFO's evidence to the Enbridge Joint Review Panel was that they had not had the resources to do any review of the hundreds of streams that would be impacted by the Enbridge project should it go ahead. So DFO, on the record, had not reviewed the impact on fish of any kind. And now, under the process that Harper has created, it will be the National Energy Board that will be responsible for fisheries, endangered species, and navigable waters if they're in the path of a pipeline. So what do we think of this? Well, it's outrageous. Uh, can we get it changed? Potentially through court action because there are legal requirements under the Fisheries Act still that would call into question. Remember when, when the National, not National Board, remember when the, the Federal Department of Fisheries and Oceans delegated responsibility for aquaculture to the BC government, mm -hmm. the court overturned that, so you can't do that. So that they have monkey wrenched the laws and weakened them. I think there's still enough shreds of responsibility for fisheries that there could be a lawsuit that would reverse that. And then of course there's the, the First Nations lawsuits that can also bring in questions uh, of the protection of their territories. And when you're when you're dismantling your environmental laws, back to your, our international reputation, one of the, the great ironies, how is it that eventually Barack Obama is going to make a decision on the Keystone Pipeline when he said it matters what the impact is on greenhouse gases, it matters what our environmental laws look like. Taking an axe to our environmental laws and destroying them, while at the same time having no climate plan, is actually hurting the chances of getting the White House to have enough public relations cover, frankly, to approve a project that Harper really wants. Now, you said maybe if we started seeing trade sanctions, it would affect his decision making. I don't know what, anything clearer than that the Keystone Project is in trouble specifically because he hasn't had a climate plan in place, and specifically because groups in the United States that are fighting Keystone are able to bring forward all these examples of the destruction of our environmental laws. Uh, it, uh, it, it's a huge irony, and, and one that doesn't seem to be getting Stephen Harper's attention. So in the coming months, I'll close with this because we should probably go, but in the coming months I will be going to Washington to continue to lobby against the Keystone pipeline and to, and to tell US legislators exactly how things are in Canada on climate and energy and environmental laws, because I, I, I think I should. So I'm gonna do that in early February, and I hope to get the Lyme disease bill passed in February, and get Michael Chong's bill passed. When I come back to report to you again, I hope I'll have a long list of good news items, including Stephen Harper's premature resignation. <laughs> here, we're in the church basement, so I can say it's a Christian impulse on my part to want to spend more time with his family. 